Hello, my name is Professor Fiona McNichtis. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And we are just over 15 weeks uh, with our battle against COVID. Uh, it was uh, absolutely appropriate that in the beginning, we focused very much on ensuring that the virus did not overwhelm our healthcare system, particularly the ICU beds. And this led to very significant, unprecedented and severe restrictions that the uh, population were asked to adhere to by the guidance from our public health medicine experts and offered to us by the government. We have in fact managed to flatten the curve and recently the number of new infections, the number of hospital admissions, and most importantly, the numbers of deaths due to COVID have significantly reduced. However, we know from other pandemics or disasters that the psychosocial impact is far greater and lasts much longer than the medical one. And indeed, it is what happens after a disaster rather than during or pre-existing risk factors that determine whether somebody will develop adverse psychosocial or mental health difficulties. There are some unique ways in which COVID has an impact on mental health. Stress and anxiety from something that is unknown and feared is to be expected. In fact, in many ways, this is welcome. It mobilizes the system. It kicks our survival strategy and it makes us alert to the risk. However, when this happens for a long period of time and when other additional stresses are added to it, it can deplete even the most resilient person's resources. There are a number of unique stressors from COVID based on a fear of the infection, a fear of transmitting it to others, but also linked with the restrictions that have been applied. A significant financial risk and unemployment in many people um, leads to additional stresses. The effect of quarantine and families in lockdown, particularly some families with additional vulnerabilities such as homeless or those with um, children with learning disabilities or those where there may have been previous uh, marital or relationship difficulties. The impact on children as a result of change in education, moving towards online, getting additional work from teachers and the loss of social contact, which previously may have been something that was very positive and rewarding for them. Indeed, the non-monetary aspects of unemployment or working from home also have an adverse effect on adults. We have been very familiar with the huge risk of COVID in our elderly population in nursing homes and residential homes based on infection rates, but also high mortality rates. However, the psychosocial impact on the elderly are also grave, particularly as a result of a significant drop in social contact, connectivity with families and with loved ones. Those with pre-existing mental illness may also be adversely affected. The stress and anxiety may destabilize their clinical presentation, overwhelming them. Those attending mental health services may worry about ongoing access, a change in the way services are delivered with a focus on telepsychiatry. Maybe some of their usual staff or key workers are not present because of podding or on account of sick leave. Individuals with learning disabilities or autism where routine and structure are so important and act as anxiety reducing aspect may also experience significant increased dis distress as a result of sudden and enforced changes on their life and those that they may not understand. They may present with escalating levels of behavioral difficulties or anxiety. Others may worry about ongoing access to medication and although these may be more feared than real, they can contribute to and destabilize their clinical presentations. COVID-19 might also um, involve new onset mental illness. We know that the virus is neurotoxic and neurotropic. And just like with other pandemics, SARS or MERS, there was an increase in onset of neuropsychiatric presentations, increasing encephalitis, delirium and neurological symptoms. We are beginning to see some of this from the data in Wuhan, but it's early days yet, and we need to look at this and observe it over a longer period of time. One group of workers deserving of special attention are the healthcare workers, not just the clinicians at the front line in the hospital, 
but also the first responders like the police, the ambulance men, the fire brigade, and community clinicians like pharmacy and other support staff. COVID is having a disproportionate negative effect on these workers. Demand has far exceeded resources available. In a hospital setting, workers are worried about getting infected themselves or transmitting the virus to other workers or family members. There is a conflict of interest between being present and attending for work and responsibilities you might have for your family or, or responsibilities as carers to elderly parents. The necessary isolation uh, procedures have meant that there may be increasing isolation of work, working from home, not having the social support of colleagues, working in pods or being deployed to new areas and working with new people that you're not familiar with. All of this can significantly de-stress the workers and we're aware that in general, healthcare workers are less likely to seek help um, than others. We must remember, although the praise and acknowledgement of their work is very welcome, they are not superheroes and we must be able to facilitate them identifying additional needs that they have and organizations being alert to providing this as we go through uh, the different phases of this pandemic. The Irish Journal of Psychological Medicine is the national scientific journal of the College of Psychiatry in Ireland. I am delighted to have co-hosted a special edition on the mental health impact of COVID-19, along with my colleagues, Dr. Blonid Gavin and Dr. John Lynn. In this issue, there are over 40 articles submitted outlining a perspective of clinicians in Ireland and from around the world on their experiences of the psychosocial aspect, the changes to services, the changes in population uh, with regard to COVID-19. We hope you will enjoy reading it, but most importantly, we hope that it may be helpful in terms of advocating for dedicated and additional mental health uh, funds that we need in order to deal with what is going to be an increase in adverse mental health outcome for a significant minority. Fortunately, most of us are resilient and we will manage to overcome the usual stresses related to any threat. Making sure we look after those that are most vulnerable is crucial at this point. So uh, we put out a call for a special issue uh, it, for uh, the Irish Journal of Psychological Medicine. And there was actually an overwhelming response. Uh, there's over 50 submissions, articles submitted, which is pretty much what we would get in, in six months of a usual year within the space of, of two weeks. Um, and we've published over 40 of these articles. We, we put them through uh, a rapid peer review. Um, so we, we got perspectives from all over the world. Um, there's uh, particularly COVID and mental health perspectives from 11 countries um, internationally. And surprisingly, uh, well, or perhaps unsurprisingly, the experiences around the world has been actually very similar. There's very similar themes coming through. Um, so initially, uh, when COVID hit initially, there was anxiety and panic. Um, people were presenting uh, with increased anxiety about getting ill, um, anxiety in relation to people who they knew had gotten ill. Um, and this, this seems to be a kind of a, a universal response um, initially. Uh, as time has gone on, there's been new stressors. Uh, there's been loss of employment, uh, financial difficulties, uh, the effects of isolation, uh, a lot of grief, um, and we haven't been able to grieve in a normal way. Um, and this has led to a lot of new types of presentations. And it should also be acknowledged that some people have actually coped very well um, during this time. And it seems to be different people are coping well. And so some people are able to cope well and others are not coping well. So it's, uh, we are getting a, a kind of a mixed picture of, of how people are coping. But on the whole, there's definitely a, a, been an increase in, in new presentations of, of mental illness. Uh, so another universal theme that we, we've noticed from, from around the world is that, is that almost everybody anticipates uh, increased mental illness in the coming months and, and, and potentially years ahead. You know, so when people go through a trauma, often there's a delay before they develop uh, more severe mental illness. 
sometimes uh, it takes time for, for mental health to deteriorate and, and, and to get worse. Um, and particularly, there's a major unknown, and that is a, a potential major economic recession uh, that lies ahead. And even in, in, the, in normal times, an economic recession is associated with, with a lot of increase in mental health difficulties. But during this unprecedented time, uh, we, we could expect that to be magnified. Uh, and we also know from uh, some of the papers in the journal who've looked um, historically over previous plagues and pandemics and, and uh, disasters uh, that there is an uh, increase in, in illnesses like anxiety, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so so this, this has been the kind of the themes. Uh, now, there has been some positives from uh, this that have been reported as well. There's definitely a sense of camaraderie and people work together during the early phases of the pandemic, um, which is great to see. And that's probably saved a lot of us from, from developing uh, difficulties. Uh, there was also a clear desire to develop and innovate. Um, so a lot of the articles received uh, describe services um, going out of their way to provide care um, while implementing social distancing. And this can be very complex in, for example, residential settings. Um, and also you've probably heard about people developing uh, telepsychiatry or, or telemedicine. Uh, so telepsychiatry is like the branch of, of telemedicine um, dedicated to psychiatry. Um, and, and this was initially delivered, I think, in Ireland as remote telephone consultations. Uh, but as time has gone on, people are, are, are developing uh, remote video consultations. Uh, so it's great to see that. And another positive that has come from this, I think, is that uh, uh, the, the pandemic has actually uh, put mental health at the fore. People have really noticed the mental health issues, just how fragile we all actually are. Um, and it has put mental health in, in the national conversation for, for a lot of people. Uh, we had a lovely paper from Bahrain, actually, who uh, in the Middle East, and they've said that the, this pandemic has actually brought about uh, mental uh, mental health conversations that would have never happened before. Uh, people are asking now, are you okay? Are you feeling lonely? Whereas in the past, this this would just not have happened. Uh, so, so, so it's good to see that. Um, so I think in the months and years ahead, we, we do need to have adequate funding. Um, if, if we can really impact on population mental health, if we approach this properly, um, and uh, I might pass you back now to Fiona, Mac uh, Professor McNicholas, um, and she, she might discuss some uh, things we can do to uh, progress this and, and, and ways we can move forward uh, at, this, at this time. So thank you. So I'd encourage the journalists to have a look at the, uh, at the papers and to read them, because in fact, as John was saying, um, it's, it's a global, it's, it's the first of its kind, dedicating a whole issue to mental health. And I think there is this realization of post-traumatic growth from a disaster. And Ireland, you know, despite its small size, has tremendous resilience. It, it, it always overreaches. And in one way, uh, the college and the Irish Journal, this is a first uh, among other countries. And it may be a way that we can actually for once start giving parity to mental health as we do to physical health. So just by way of drawing attention to this from the media, um, we can see and we know the tsunami of mental health issues are coming. We know that anecdotally from us working as clinicians in emergency hospitals and in community health, mental health care settings. We also know it from data that has been published, not in Ireland as yet, there's small beginnings of research, but more from the EU and from China and from other countries in the UK as well. We're aware that pre-COVID, the mental health services had already been under-resourced and underfunded with reference to what's now an outdated vision for change. And in fact, the UN, UN uh, has said that th this is typical worldwide where chronic years of underfunding and neglect. So we're starting off in Ireland before COVID already recognizing the deficits in our service. And so in order to cater for additional need coming down the line. We are going to need very careful planning and resourcing. The other big risk factor, which you may not be aware of, is occupational stress um, has already been identified as very, very high in healthcare workers and doctors in particular, far greater than other occupations. And again, Ireland, sadly, in the EU occupational uh, surveys 
has shown the quickest or the highest increase in that. This is before COVID. In our own study that we did of child psychiatry in Ireland before COVID, uh, there were significant levels of burnout with a lot of consultants stating that they had seriously considered changing job and not encouraging or not considering re-entry into the field. Given the additional stressors that we now know are occurring on the service, it's really important we don't have a second hit to mental health services, characterized by staff leave, staff illness, staff burnout, and being unable to meet the need of the population that will so desperately need us. Yes, so, so we certainly don't want the message that everybody is going to have mental health dis disturbance. That is not the case. There's a small minority. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder in the general population may reach around 5 to 7% based on other studies. Um, but in the healthcare worker, it's much, much higher. The majority will be resilient, but for the small minority who will have mental health uh, disorders that need specialist help, we need to make sure that whatever resources are available, whatever additional resources come to fore, whatever new planning that we can make in the mental health services are directed to those that need it most. And that comes with economic advantage because we know that the cost of depression and anxiety cost trillions every year before COVID. The fact that that's going to increase now and is coupled with unemployment means if we don't tackle mental health psychopathology, we are looking to the longest recovery and recession that has ever been um, experienced. I, I just want to end with a positive note to say that we are aware of post-traumatic growth. And there is the possibility that Ireland and ourselves can emerge from this with a new vision where mental health reaches parity with physical health, but where everybody realizes that your health and your mental health impacts directly on mine. So we cannot tolerate uh, inequalities and disparities. We need to make sure there's no more divides in the provision of services. And it is an opportunity, it's in our hands, whether we choose to pick it up or not is dependent on all of us. It's dependent on the media, making sure that the policies and that the government don't let this drop. It's dependent on us as healthcare clinicians, providers to continue to advocate. It's dependent on College of Psychiatry to take the lead in advocating for our services. The uh, WHO and the UN specify particularly two age groups, child, uh, adolescents and young adults, and the elderly. Um, if you think about it, the impact on the elderly by virtue of the quarantining, the cocooning, has been so significant. The lack of social supports, their inability to conduct their normal routines, but also because they will be doubly vulnerable to additional medical concerns. So you're not only having the kind of psychological aspects of COVID on mental health, you're also having the infection aspect of it. And um, we know that there's an increased amount of delirium, dementia, cardiovascular illness in the elderly, even if they're not part of that three risk group, diabetes, high blood pressure, and um, uh, obesity. So the elderly are double whammied by virtue of medical and physical sequelae, and adding on top of that the psychosocial impact of quarantine and cocooning. If you look at the young people, the 15 to 25 year old group, first of all, that is the age of onset of serious mental illness. And we know that early intervention actually can make a huge difference to limit lifelong disability. Our worry is that we're not as able to pick that up now because we're not engaging with those young people by virtue of non-face-to-face -face consultations or the fact that services are so stretched. The other thing is the huge impact of loss of social connectivity in a group of adolescents that are only social animals at that stage and they get most of their social support. The fact that that has gone has been hugely uh, negative but also their whole identity and their future planning. Education, leaving cert, unemployment, lack of job, security, that has been huge to those young people. We know that maladaptive practices are already happening. Surveys done in Canada would show that there's been an increase of about 40% in the use of alcohol in the young age population. 
Um, younger children are at risk by virtue of the lockdown effects, the increased emotional, um, expressed emotion at home, and the increase in domestic violence, which has been considered an outrage. Uh, so young people and, and uh, women are more vulnerable to that perspective. The only thing we can say in the benefit of children is they are not, although they may be infected by COVID, fortunately, the severity of their illnesses at the moment is considered to be less clinically severe. Um, but time will tell, new presentations are emerging all the time. I'd echo all that. Um, and also, I guess, people who are already particularly vulnerable, uh, like those, those with intellectual disabilities. Um, it's been, there's an article in the journal from uh, Court, Ken Courtney, um, and he highlights that people with autism might be particularly vulnerable due to changes in routines. Um, then there's also, um, uh, our, I mean, it's important that people who are already vulnerable, like the homeless, uh, people have mentioned uh, people mentally ill, people in prisons, uh, uh, these people who are already vulnerable could, could be um, uh, affected. Uh, so, so as with kind of generally with mental illness, people who are socially disadvantaged um, would, would also be, be affected. But certainly, as, as Fiona mentioned, uh, the elderly, for, for multiple reasons, isolation, uh, grief, um, and, and the, the effects of people who've actually had the, had COVID and the post, the, the after effects of that. And as always, our, our young people um, and youth mental health is, is always important. Yeah, well, there's, there's, a, there's a paper in the journal actually by Pat Devish, um, and he's done a kind of historical review of suicides and self-harm uh, during pandemics, uh, emergencies like 9-11, uh, during the troubles in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting paper after the 7-7 the seven, seven attacks in London. Um, and what he found was, uh, his conclusion essentially is that there, there's potential for an increase in, in self-harm behaviours. Um, whether there could be an increase in suicide rates is, is, isn't fully clear. Um, one of the biggest risk factors perhaps for an increase in suicide rates might be if there was a severe economic recession and there was widespread financial difficulties. Uh, that, that's what he found, was that, that that could be something that we'd be very concerned about, could increase um, in, in, in suicides and, and, and obviously self-harm behaviours as well. Um, so aside from that, there isn't uh, much uh, hard data that we have on, on self-harm and suicide. Suicide is, is, is a reasonably rare outcome and a difficult thing to study in, in any case. Um, and it uh, would need to be studied over, over a period of time. So, so we don't have any data on, on kind of actual suicides um, as yet from, from the COVID, but, but I would imagine that data will come out in, in the coming months and, and, and the times ahead. Thank you for asking that question because you're probably aware that in Ireland, the leading cause of death in the 15 to 25 year old males is of suicide. And certainly uh, huge efforts have, have been put in to try and address that issue. Um, so given that, and given what we know about that young age group, it's important we think about it. Some of the factors associated with suicide, depression, alcohol use, we know those rates from previous pandemics have increased and we see them in our clinics increasing rates. The only th word of caution I'd have for you is that uh, one or two deaths by suicide sadly really distorts the suicide rate because fortunately it is very rare per 100,000. But that doesn't mean there should be any complacency in trying to make sure that uh, we focus on it. So really a better question is uh, looking at suicidality, those that present with suicidal ideation and those that present, as John says, with deliberate self-harm. Clinically, we are seeing increase in numbers, both to pediatric hospitals and to adult hospitals. And on a recent liaison psychiatry meeting I had on uh, Friday morning, there was a, a, an acknowledgement that rates in the 16 to 18 year old had increased. So we, we clinicians, I'm not involved in that necessarily, but we will be putting together that data and no doubt presenting it to the journal uh, once we have a significant number of months it's important, I feel, that the data we present is not knee-jerk reactions. There was initial lull in presentations to the emergency department, probably coupled with the fear that everybody had that they would get infected. But now we're beginning to see an increase in uh, presentations. And you really need about at least three months post-pandemic 
to compare with three months pre-pandemic in order to, be say, to consider what is the attributable increase uh, to COVID per se. And, and that data will come out just as soon as uh, it, it's available and valid to present. Yeah, that, yes, that was actually uh, addressed in 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 um, in that paper I was, I was I was referring to. Actually, during the troubles in Northern Ireland, there was uh, there was less suicide rates than actually after the troubles. Um, so so you're right. People do work together, and uh, self harm and 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 suicide it can build up over time. It's it's often not something that people just decide to do very quickly. Um, so we would certainly anticipate in in the in the months and years ahead. That the, the traumas that people have experienced during this pandemic, that they will they, they will be vulnerable uh, to, to, to this in, in the time ahead. Um, as, as Fiona said, initially there was a lull, and I think particularly it felt like wartime when the lockdown was, was initially brought in. Um, and, and during those times, it's, it's very possible that, that, that you know people were protected from presenting. Um, but as she mentioned, I think things are definitely increasing now. Uh, we're seeing complex presentations coming in uh, anecdotally. There, there's no question, no, no. Uh, and the presentations coming in are complex. Um, you know, for, as clinicians, you're, you're making decisions whether to admit people to a hospital uh, where you know you, there, there could be risk of, of COVID uh, with exposure to these kind of residential settings as well. So, uh, the decisions that the clinicians are making are, are complex. Um, uh, so, so, essentially, it's something we definitely need to monitor um, and and and. Uh, into closely in the coming months. And as you say, really the toll will be for a couple of years. And this is why it's so important that we start to focus on planning for that and that we don't stop looking at the mental health impact of COVID. Because as sure as we're here today talking, there will be another pandemic in due course. And we need to be preparing ourselves for future pandemics and strengthening our weakest links, which coming into COVID was certainly mental health. Uh, so I think there's been an, an increase in, in depression, anxiety, uh, deliberate self-harm. Uh, th these are definitely presentations. Th these are the common presentations that we see anyway. Um, and th these are the presentations that, that we're seeing. Uh, there have been certain, some kind of new presentations like people are preoccupied with, uh, with having COVID. I think we saw that earlier uh, during the pandemic, uh, that possibly. Is, is eased off now. I think there, there's less anxiety around that. Um, then in, in terms of what, what we can do, um, I mean, I think uh, prior to this pandemic, mental health was underfunded anyway. Um, and we need to resource uh, mental health services as per vision for change, I guess, is, is, is one, uh, one kind of target that, that we should have. And this was, uh, we are anticipating the, the vision for change that might be uh, discussed next week or, or quite soon um, and I'm sure that'll be open for, for a lot of discussion uh, but we certainly need to have a baseline proper resourcing of, of mental health services um, across the board and, and I think child and adolescent services have been particularly uh, under resourced I think Fiona can can discuss that in more detail um, yeah, but certainly we need to invest in mental health of our young uh, for, the, for the future um, and I suppose it can be difficult to do that during times of a pandemic now, but that, that's, that's certainly something that, that we absolutely have to do. But in Crumlin, where I work in a paediatric setting, what has really um, kind of surprised us is the huge range of problems. We wouldn't have expected it until we saw it. So the first thing is that you have neuropsychiatry aspects where somebody presents with psychosis and delusions, and it incorporates the um, anxiety about the virus into their delusions. So they're fearful of dying by the virus, they're fearful of catching it, and it extends to other areas. The other aspect was from a behavioral perspective. We've had admissions of young people in the hospital where they have neurodevelopmental disorders, autism, where they've been very well managed and coping with their routine of going to school, after school activities, respite periods. 
And when forced with lockdown and staying at home in an environment which you can imagine is going to be very stressful for the families and raised expressed emotion, the young person has exhibited significant behavioural difficulties. And the fact that they don't understand why they need to social distance outside, why they can't go to their school, uh, adds to their anxiety. And so they have presented in acute distress states. Interestingly, we've had two different presentations with regard to eating concerns. We've had the case of a, a severe exacerbation and indeed really onset of anorexia nervosa. We have permission from the families and we will be writing these up as case reports for publication. But where the lockdown precipitated in a young person who had otherwise managed body image issues very normally in terms of just exercising well, and paying attention to calorie balance. Suddenly with lockdown and the loss of their ability to engage in usual exercises led them to overfocus on uh, eating and they presented in a very malnourished state with um, typical anorexic behavior. And a second case of a young boy who was, he had no psychopathology before this, a uh, very fit, active, uh, well-functioning young boy the inability to engage in his usual activities meant that he started doing his own exercise, just like many of the country, which has been a very positive thing. But unfortunately for him, it led to an exercise addiction. And he started to get the secondary benefit from the adrenaline linked with exercise and exercise to the point where he lost 20% of his body weight and again was medically compromised. And um, we've had cases where families have been in lockdown and where one parent hasn't been able to visit the other. That happens in a hospital setting as well, where only one parent is allowed visit, and where there, there's additional stresses on the rest of the family, but where tensions between families has run high, and it has led to, I suppose, um, unhelpful parenting strategies, and the young person may have presented the parent or the child at a time of a crisis looking for uh, respite care. And then we have seen um, the typical, I mean, we, sadly, we often see a lot of deliberate self-harm in young adolescents, and these have continues. I can't tell you at the moment whether our rates are any higher than they were before COVID, because unfortunately in Crumlin, it's compounded by the fact that Temple Street, the Tala Emergency Department joined up with Crumlin. So all of Tala cases are now coming to Crumlin. And although we've seen increased numbers, it's going to be diff difficult to disentangle what was as a result of two emergency departments together versus any new surge from COVID. But again, we will look at those data carefully and um, we have some medical students helping us with that and we would hope to have that available in a couple of months. Yes. And if, if I asked you all to reflect yourself and how you have kept sane, I think we would all say the same thing. It's so important to have a routine. If you're not going out to work, it's so important to try and have a separation between I'm working now and now is my home time. Normally the drive home from work or better still the cycle home would have given you that change in, uh, in position. But work is spilling into everybody's life at home. People are working far more hours than they did when they were physically at work. And the tension of having kids at home complicates your ability to work. So those that are coping well are having a structure. They're engaging in, in exercise, which is ironic. It has taken us a disaster like this to actually start practicing some positive health strategies and to refocus on quality of, of family and, and loved one interaction. Um, and obviously good exercise, sleep and eating habits as well. I think it's um, so some people have coped well with uh, being in that family unit together, whereas others uh, struggle to cope as well. Um, and I think there's been increased pressure in society with uh, as schools are closed, kids aren't going to school. So that um, there's potentially for some people, that's an extra workload on parents while they might be trying to do their daily work as well possibly from home so they're effectively doing everyone's doing extra work it's extra stress and for, in some cases uh, people people will really struggle with that uh, just in terms of anxiety there is actually a paper just published today in in the journal um by uh Roisin Plunkett and Brian Hallahan um it's, it's just come out and it's a, it's actually a, a data-driven paper 
um, about anxiety during the COVID pandemic. Um, as I was looking up, it, it's actually just come out today. So um, there, there isn't that much data published because it takes time to do research to get ethics approval and, and, and conduct research. Uh, so, so I think that would be an interesting article to have a look at. I think it's probably fair to say that we don't have data yet from Ireland. Um, I know St. John of God's have done a survey of healthcare staff um, and that data will be, you know, coming out hopefully shortly. Uh, there isn't a sense that occupational health have been overwhelmed or have had significant increases. But I draw your attention to studies that have been done in other countries. In uh, the UK, what they have found is that pre-COVID, there was about a 40% distress level amongst healthcare workers. And you can imagine um, that that is to be expected at times. But in the first few weeks after COVID, they saw a third of their yearly volume being referred and looking for supports. And that is one of the, um, on surveys that have been done also by other groups in the UK, healthcare workers are saying they do want access to psychological supports. Um, I think in terms of what we know from the data um, that uh, from SARS and MERS, what's happening, I mean, Front care workers or health um, healthcare workers in these pandemics are not only faced with um, the anxiety of can they cope uh, with what's coming at them, but there's also that personal anxiety from the infection and the risk in the beginning there, there wasn't sufficient PPE and that added additional layers of, of stress. And I think with SARS they found after about a year, the prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder was about 15%. Um, so I think in Ireland, we just don't have the data yet, but because we went into it with the realisation, both from uh, work that Blonet Hayes had done in general hospital settings and our own work in terms of CAMS stress level, stresses were already high. We're, we're just about to look at data on um, AMS and CAMS, adult and child mental health, uh, multidisciplinary staff by way of their stress level before COVID, the survey was done. And so it does allow us to go back and repeat that survey uh, six to nine months later, where you might see that our coping strategies have been depleted. You have to remember that the first thing that happens in the stress is, you know, the person says, is this a good or a bad thing? Obviously COVID is a bad stress. The second thing people have to ask themselves is can I cope or not? And those that are able to cope or feel they're able to cope will cope much more adaptively. But even in that group, there's a finite amount of reserve that they have. And unless organizations start to prioritize their healthcare workers, start to notice them and continue to touch base with them, uh, they, they will be at risk of burnout. Healthcare workers typically, by nature of the characteristics, they're a little bit uh, perfectionistic. They, they, they set high responsibilities on themselves to deal with issues. When they're faced with the stress, what they do is they dive into work and they reduce the amount of other replenishing social activities and leisure activities that they do. So they continue at this performance kind of plateau for a while, and then you see a huge performance cliff. And that's when patient safety issues start to come into the mix and where actually then the patient population that they're dealing with are also at risk by virtue of the healthcare worker not being able to adequately cope. So organizations have to anticipate that this is going to happen amongst us, make sure that they actually uh, value and let, them, let us know how much that they are there to provide additional supports for us, and then monitor our progress by way of how we are doing. And in the journal, there's some examples of how to do that by way of balance groups or Schwartz rounds or mindful practice. Your employer has a responsibility to look after their healthcare workers. And that employer needs to look at the uh, support systems they have in place and make sure that they're proactive at this time. Previously, they had been in response to you contacting them. There needs to be a shift in organizations being proactive at this time. Uh, there also needs to be the re recognition that you don't have to maintain your stance as a hero. You know, it's absolutely acceptable and important that you do admit to not coping and being vulnerable and taking time off. Even annual leave has been um, reduced mandatory in the case of the police force, 
um, and in the case of clinicians by necessity because they've had so much work to prepare for. But um, also um, the government, government needs to support additional supports going into that. Maybe just also to mention that the police force is an area that hitherto had not been considered by way of the burnout. The huge pressure on our police, on Garda Siakona, at the forefront of this crisis and dealing with new urgent legislations that are huge for society and having to police that has been huge. And uh, we're certainly aware that, um, you know, the police themselves do feel vulnerable and they do feel that there may not be that culture of being able to uh, get access to mental health supports within their own organisation. Another thing, I think it was a good point that Fiona made about, uh, you know, uh, frontline professions, they can be quite perfectionistic and when their workload increases, um, they could be left with a, the unenviable task of managing home life, uh, personal responsibilities outside of work with work life and this this can become extremely stressful for people um, there's also another concept that was brought up in, in one of the letters actually by Ono Sullivan about moral injury um, and, and it probably didn't come uh, to pass in Ireland but uh, where you could be left with, with no ICU beds left and, and healthcare professionals have to making a decision about whether to admit one person or another person to ICU knowing that the one that doesn't go um, may actually be at high risk of dying. So, so th this, um, fortunately, I don't think this came to pass because of the, the, you know, the work of the Irish people, the Irish government, uh, you know, um, didn't let the surge become uh, so bad on health services. Um, but, but there certainly was a lot of stress on health services during that initial surge. And fortunately, I, I think we, we just about got, got through it with, without um, being left with those awful decisions that we, we couldn't need to be made. And, and an extension of that moral injury, John, was the fact that there was a precipitous push for medical students and junior nurses to actually get onto the front line to bump up the numbers in case we needed them. And so their, their normal kind of completion of their degrees was accelerated. And um, volunteerism, we know, you know, where people volunteer to do jobs. Um, exposes the student to stressors that they may not be aware, you know, it questions whether uh, they have really given informed consent to take on new responsibilities, whether they've been adequately prepared to do so. Um, so uh, again, healthcare workers include healthcare trainees who are working. And the pharmacists are another group where with the shift from non-face-to-face access for some people. The pharmacist, by virtue of the fact they're in your community, became in a way a very important provider of health care, uh, medical and mental health care. And the pharmacist was needing to make sure that medication stocks were there, that you know they allowed both to give extra stocks, but at the same time ensure somebody wasn't stockpiling or that elderly people weren't getting confused and taking too many medications. And they have been exposed to significant, but perhaps unrecognized additional stress during this. Again, legislation has changed for, for the pharmacy and uh, they've had to cope with that as they're um, continuing to support their uh, clients. We know that the prevalence of mental health is double the rate if you have a medical problem as well. So those that have medical problems are twice as likely to have mental health problems. If the medical problem involves the central nervous system, you're five times as likely. So in the cohort of young people or elderly people with uh, dementia, cardiovascular illness, epilepsy, anything affecting the brain, they are increased at risk of having mental health problems. And um, health anxiety is another confounder because those that do have physical symptoms, it's difficult for them to know, are they genuine physical symptoms or are they as a result of anxiety imposed by COVID? The clinical presentation of COVID is expanding all the time. The initial first clinical symptoms of cough, temperature, shortness of breath have now in, in hugely increased to headaches, GI systems, microvascular problems. And so individuals who might normally have felt a little bit unwell the, the issue is, is this COVID? 
or is it just health anxiety? If it's health anxiety, they may not want to present to the emergency to, uh, presentation and stay away. Uh, and, and when they do present, the difficulty is disentangling that. So I think that usual and serious enough medical problems may be either misattributed to anxiety or deliberately ignored on account of the risk of presentations. And certainly you look at the cancer screening programs, uh, you look at the, the expected presentations from MIs, uh, they are not presenting and we should anticipate additional deaths as a result of late presentation. Uh, but you are right, it's a double whammy again when it comes to those with mental health problems. Sometimes by virtue of the medication they're on, they're at risk of uh, metabolic problems, obesity, and that brings them into that higher risk group. They're also at risk by their lifestyle of perhaps excessive smoking and alcohol use, and that again brings them in, treated not as healthy and they're slightly more immunosuppressed, and they're more likely to be homeless, and therefore again, their ability to stay safe from COVID and maintain social distancing is reduced. So, there's a huge number of um, complicated reasons why uh, mental health is really taking centrality and should be at this point in time. Yeah, and I think I think there it's right. It's a, it's an unknown um, whether people with severe mental illness aren't actually presenting to services due to COVID um, and concerns about getting COVID. Um, certainly, anecdotally, we've noticed some people not wanting to come in uh, for assessments in clinics. Uh, with illness and, and we don't know how mentally unwell they actually are. Um, again, there could be a surge coming for this group of people. Um, uh, as I think particularly in the elderly, this, this could very much be a, a possibility uh, as the elderly population might be particularly fearful of, of developing COVID. Um, and then I think you mentioned addictions as well. That this is, there has definitely been um, a different, a change in people's uh, consumption of alcohol um, um, I mean, people with uh, addiction issues previously, again, we don't know how, how they are doing or, uh, you know, whether they need help at the moment. Uh, there has been some progressions, like there has been AA meetings held by Zoom and online, which is, has been very good. Um, and I think that's, that's the way we need to do to continue those supports, because, I mean, a lot of people with addictions probably have been attending the likes of AA regularly for a very long time, and they haven't been able to do it during the lockdown. Um, so the effects of that, I'm not an addictions expert, but the effects of that, I suppose, are, would be unknown as well. Even if you think, John, with the addictions, you know, there's some evidence coming out about vitamin C and vitamin D and zinc. So from a nutritional point of view, many of our uh, young, well, more the older person who's chronically addicted has very um, significant nutritional imbalance. And again, that's a risk factor for them. Um, telepsychiatry is going amazingly well. It's funny, pre-COVID, uh, we had spent a lot of time trying to propose to uh, the um, mental health. We had met with Minister Davey. We had put in proposals to fund an ECHO, a virtual clinic on mental health. And we didn't get any traction. And suddenly, this is one of the benefits of COVID. The need to suddenly, for infection reduction rates, move to telepsychiatry pretty promptly has allowed it to be uh, adopted very, very successfully by nearly all the mental health services, from child to adult to old age, and even within the uh, forensic setting. Um, it has worked very well. I think there are certain cases where clinicians would know they would be more um, in favor of a face-to-face. -face. Typically new assessments, although not all, some new assessments have happened uh, via telepsychiatry, typically Zoom, where you do have that ability to have more visual and nonverbal um, evidence to support. Um, but maybe acute psychotic or behavioral difficulties, obviously there also is need to have that therapeutic milieu and containment, and that is important to do in a face-to-face -face settings. So there may be some uh, new presentations that will lend itself to telepsychiatry. There certainly is very good evidence when you know somebody and you're offering continuing therapeutic intervention or continuing ADHD management, or in a cohort I work with eating disorders where you might have been very worried about the medical risk. We've actually managed very well to maintain that with telepsychiatry for the majority of cases. 
uh, there is a piece in the paper um, by um, a group looking at the benefits or the concerns by clinicians with regard to telephone consultation. And, you know, that's interesting because some of the concerns about the nonverbal or their inability to um, make sure there's a safety net. Obviously, in a hospital setting, if you do an assessment and you're worried about somebody's mental state, you may suggest that they are admitted. And in fact, you may need to insist they're admitted. But when you're having telepsychiatry and you have that concern, it's slightly more difficult then to act on that. You need to involve uh, other members and sometimes even the police to facilitate that. So there are some concerns about it in certain cases. When they've looked at evidence uh, from other studies about the uh, validity of telepsychiatry, it has been shown to be as effective as face-to-face. -face. And even in cases of new assessments for autism, which you know might surprise some people. So I think, again, one of the positives going forward and also the importance of um, appropriate planning of our mental health services going forward, we'll be looking at a blended model of providing face-to-face um, -face and when possible and feasible uh, telepsychiatry and continuing to make sure that clinicians and patients are both appropriately trained, that the clinical governance is clear, that the setting is safe, you know, that there's nobody coercing somebody to answer questions on the phone um, you know, somebody who's in an abusive relationship, if their partner's on the other side of the screen, obviously you're not going to be able to conduct a safe assessment. So all of that training is important, but I do think it will be the way things will happen going forward and that we will have more echo type uh, uh, mental health services provided. Yeah, uh, will I say a few words? I, mean, I suppose the um, telepsychiatry is um, certainly has uh, come to the fore in services. Um, so telemedicine is, is basically providing healthcare from a remote location, and it can be by phone or uh, video co conferencing. And then telepsychiatry is essentially doing that in, in the field of psychiatry. Um, so initially, the services uh, in Ireland would have done a lot of their assessments by phone consultation. Uh, they wouldn't have been set up for uh, video conferencing. Um, and there is a survey done in Vincent's, uh, Leonard Douglas and the Green Alwell uh, did a paper in the journal. Uh, they surveyed the clinicians and their experiences of that. And there was pluses and minuses. Uh, I think some of the concerns were that uh, could clinicians develop, uh, and this is for phone consultations, uh, could, could clinicians develop uh, a, a rapport? Uh, could they, could they, uh, Get a, a do um, conduct a diagnostic assessment properly. Uh, technological issues like um, people not having uh, clear uh, phone lines or, or being cut off, and then like Fiona mentioned uh, as well, uh, concerns about safety concerns. Who is in the room with the person? Are you doing it safely? Uh, a big uh, issue as well that has come up is in emergency assessments when there's kind of imminent risks. Uh, for example, you know risk of self harm. Uh, people might have had concerns about doing assessments in that setting uh, because you're not with the person, uh, you, you know, and this poses a new scenario where, you know, you might be on the phone to somebody and, and, and there's a, a significant risk on, on the other side of the line. So, so there definitely are, are some concerns and some, some challenges. And, it, and some of the benefits are obviously it, it allows social distancing. Um, it allows us to do assessments for people who might struggle to leave their house in, in any case. Um, and this is quite common and uh, these are difficult to reach people and they might struggle to come into a clinic for, particularly initially um, so, so that's certainly a, a, an aspect that perhaps we need to look at longer term that we provide that service um, and uh, then it's more convenient as well and it can, it can be done at, at, at any time and, and uh, so, so, so there, there certainly are benefits. Uh, so I think the longer this the pandemic goes on and we need to social distance the more services are going to develop uh, video conferencing facilities and the more likely that the people will use it in their day-to-day -day practice into the future. Uh, but precisely how they do that uh, isn't fully clear and it may vary from service to service. Um, Um, just uh, John and Fiona have talked about um, telepsychiatry and telemedicine. I suppose my experience has really been that pandemics tend to exacerbate inequalities and certainly 
you know, different HSE facilities and different private facilities have had different access to telepsychiatry and telemedicine. And also, um, depending on where you work, uh, a lot of the catchment area wouldn't have access to the IT to be able to benefit from it. Um, so I, I don't think it's equal across the board. I suppose the other, just in my role in the college as uh, Director of External Affairs and Public Education, I think the college has really an opportunity now, and we all have, to advocate for good quality mental illness services. And I know that we have been in, we have written to all the possible uh, political leaders of the parties whenever we get this government. And we have asked that they really prioritize mental illness services really for the nation. And I suppose with the mental health ramifications of the virus, that's extra important. I, I'm, I suppose this is a party political broadcast, but we really have a national emergency in relation to recruitment and retention for mental health services. Um, we all know that we had 100 vacancies uh, before the COVID uh, situation, and our workforce planning documents have said that we need 800 specialist psychiatrists by 2023. That's only a couple of years around the road, down the road, and we're not even halfway to achieving that figure. Our, I suppose our amount of the budget of health that's going to mental health is really paltry, 6% of the health budget. We're, we have been advocating as the college and to government that we need doubling of that immediately, so up to 12%. And we also really need cabinet and government departments to appoint people like super junior minister for mental health and a mental health director who sits on the HSE leadership team. I think the pandemic is really going to stretch our mental health services that are already underfunded and under-resourced. And I mean, our seminal document, The Vision for Change, that was in 2006. It's 14 years out of date. And an awful lot of the aims of it didn't come to fruition. Our, the child and adolescent mental health services are working on about 55% of the capacity predicted in 2006. And our population has gone up to 4.75 million. We're not ready. And I, I would really love that for the journalists here to, to take on the fact that we're doing our level best with the psychological sequelae of the pandemic, but we urgently need um, that input uh, of budget into the mental health service. And I think the particular thing that might make the difference to the government is the fact that economically, uh, if we don't put this input in in terms of funding, we are going to go into a long recession because there will be so many uh, unwell people after this COVID-19 that they will be unable to take up their uh, role in, in economic recovery and they will be um, really quite unwell for quite a long time and will plunge us into a deeper recession. So here ends the political broadcast. <laughs> okay. And if, if, I, if I could just use a, a phrase from Luther King, Martin Luther King, it's the fierce urgency of now, Maeve, absolutely. It's so key that um, the media, and we implore you to continue to raise this issue because far too often it's something awful like a suicide in a young child that leads to a little bit of media attention and government focus. And then as soon as that crisis is over, unfortunately, it gets very deep. And if we remember that your health is dependent on my health, um, and that being of the uh, person who is mentally ill, vulnerable, homeless, um, you know, we, we have to protect all of us and the time to do it is now.